In this video, we're going to look at the third law of thermodynamics, and we're going to look at some examples of how we can determine <clears throat> qualitatively uh, the change in entropy for a reaction. So just to recap a little bit, uh, we have the first law of thermodynamics, which says that energy can't be created or destroyed. So in any chemical process, energy can only be transferred from the system to the surroundings or from the surroundings to the system. So you can't, um, in the net, gain or lose energy. Then in the last video, we talked about the second um, law of, of thermodynamics, which was that entropy will always increase in a, phys in a chemical or physical process. So um, even if we have a chemical process where we're making the system more organized, to do that, we must be making the surroundings, um, we must be increasing the entropy of the surroundings even more than the loss of entropy of the system or vice versa. So in the net, entropy must always increase, whether it's an increase in entropy of the system or an increase in entropy of the surroundings. When you add those two up, you're always gonna get a positive uh, delta S. Okay, so now the third law of thermodynamics basically sets a limit on entropy. Um, and this limit is, well, basically the, the law itself says that we have to kind of define what zero entropy is. It's, we can't ever, we won't ever see this in the universe, but we can set a sort of a lower limit for what should be at zero entropy. And that is a substance that's perfectly crystalline. Um, at zero Kelvin will have zero entropy. So um, the, 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 this gives us sort of a, a reference point for all other entropy. So meaning if we, if we start with a perfectly crystalline solid, meaning every atom is perfectly organized in three-dimensional space, and none of those atoms are moving because we're at zero Kelvin. So we know exactly where everything is. It's perfectly ordered. Then from there, any change to that, we can figure out, well, okay, from that one state to this state, we've had this much change in disorder. So this allows us to do a couple of things. This allows us to say that for one thing, um, what if we were to just heat a solid sample? Um, and we know that heating a sample should increase the entropy, right? Because uh, when we go from zero Kelvin to anything greater than zero Kelvin, the atoms are going to start moving. And they're going to start moving in ways that are not necessarily the most predictable, meaning they're going to start to oscillate. So then if we think of our solid, we won't necessarily know precisely where the atom is because it's moving in sort of a range. There's going to be a probability that it's going to be in a certain place, but we won't know exactly where it is. So we can use our equation for this, that delta S is equal to the heat that's transferred divided by the temperature. Now, so we have to go back to our understanding from chapter 6. When we heat up a sample, the heat transfer that changes the temperature of a sample is equal to mc delta T, right? So this is the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. And then we can say, well, okay, if that's the heat that's transferred, then the temperature is the temperature average, meaning if delta T is equal to T final minus T initial, then uh, T final plus T initial divided by 2 is equal to T average. So if we heat it up from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, the average temperature would be 50 degrees Celsius, and then the delta T would be um, the 100 degrees Celsius minus the 0 degrees Celsius, and that would be 50 degrees Celsius. So now we have an equation that allows us to um, look at delta S of heating a solid sample. And then if we think of phase changes, we already have this from a, a sort of a, an understanding from um, the second law of thermodynamics. We know that a phase change will result... in a large increase in entropy. 
And we know that this is, again, delta S is going to equal Q over T. And this is going to equal the delta H of whatever the process is over T, where this could be vaporization, fusion, whatever the process is. So now what we can do is we can basically say we can take these two equations, starting with zero entropy at zero Kelvin, and we can figure out what entropy any system will have um, if we heat it up from zero Kelvin and then we do whatever phase changes we need to do. So let's go back to our graph here that we marked up in the last video. So here's what I'm talking about. So in this graph, we can now understand this a little differently. We can, if you look at zero Kelvin, the standard entropy is zero. Um, so what we can do is as we start to heat it up, the entropy rises. And here, what we're doing is, is we're doing delta S is equal to MC delta T over T average. So that's this rise in, in entropy. And then we said that the phase changes is, can be given by delta S is equal to delta H over T. So from this graph and from this, um, these two equations that we have, we can use those equations to come up with the entropy at any given temperature for a system. So we're going to talk about what the effect of this is in just a second when we talk about standard entropies. So now we can define what we call a standard entropy. And this gets the symbol S0 or S0. Um, so a standard entropy is the, is the entropy value um, for the standard state of a species And we have to remember what standard state means. So standard state, if we can think back to chapter six, this is a pure substance uh, at one atmosphere of pressure um, or one molar if it's a solution. Um, and then also the 25 degrees Celsius rule applies. So it's a one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius or a one molar solution and 25 degrees Celsius. So what is a standard entropy? Well, what we're doing is, is we're basically, to come up with a standard entropy, we take a sample and we start with zero entropy down at zero Kelvin. Then we have to get it to standard conditions. So we're gonna heat it up until we get it to um, a temperature of 298 Kelvin and a pressure of one atmosphere. And when we do that, we're gonna do some heating. We might do a phase change depending on what phase it's in at standard state. So the sum of the MC delta T plus the phase change plus the MC delta T, adding all of that up from zero for that particular sample is gonna give us the standard entropy. And then what we can do is we can make a table of these. So if you look in, in um, if you look in, in table 18.1 what you get is you're going to you're going to see a table of all of these different compounds and they're going to have an s naught um associated with it and they're all going to be in here so you can take a look but all of these values come from what i'm talking about basically these values are heated up from um from zero kelvin and and that's that's how you come up with these these entropies so now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how to um, use the third law of thermodynamics to predict increase in, in, in entropy. So we actually have a lecture problem based on this. And for the, this lecture problem, we're going to look at predicting the sign of the entropy change of a reaction. So we know that there's a few things that we can look for. We can look for an increase in the number of moles of gas. That will tell us an increase in entropy. We can look for... Um, a process that leads to a phase change. And we know that if we're going to I, from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas, we're getting increases in entropy. And we can also look for things that break up into pieces. Um, meaning they decompose. So we start with one organized thing and they, they break up into multiple pieces. So let's just take a look at some examples. 
So A, it's pretty clear we start with a solid and we wind up with a liquid and a gas. So this is definitely going to be an increase in entropy for this system. Um, so this involves two different things. We're, we're making a liquid and we're making a gas, and we're also decomposing it into two different pieces. So clearly an increase in entropy. Now let's look at B. So B, we're going from ammonia gas and CO2 gas to this compound, uh, NH2, CO, NH2, and water. So we're going from two moles of gas to no moles of gas and to an aqueous and a liquid solution. So this one is going to be pretty clearly a decrease in entropy for the system. Now again, remember that just because we're decreasing the entropy of the system, to do this, we're, we must be therefore increasing the entropy of the surroundings more to give us a net positive delta S. Now let's look at um, C. Now C is an interesting one. I think there might have been a typo in my in my notes because if you oh I'm sorry I, I'm I'm wrong. So uh, with CO we have CO gas and H2O gas goes to CO2 gas and H2O gas. See I even I even missed I thought it was CO2 going to CO2. So in this case it's a little bit difficult to tell. We have two moles of gas and we have two moles of gas. We don't know. So this one qualitatively would be a question mark. I'm going to show you in, a, in the next part of this video how to actually um, figure that out. So how can we calculate the delta S for that reaction? Now, the next one, we go from a solid calcium carbonate to calcium oxide and CO2 gas. So this one's going to be an increase in entropy and so on and so forth. So um, liquid to a gas is going to be an increase in entropy. A liquid and a gas goes to two solids is going to be a decrease in entropy. And then we have uh, sodium oxide is a solid plus a liquid. We get an aqueous solution and a gas, so that's going to be an increase in entropy. So this could be how we might construct a multiple choice question. Which of the following would give an increase in entropy?